Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Our readings for uh, this week are for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany, which falls on January 28th, 2024. Our first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Our psalm is the 111th psalm. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. And our gospel is Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. We have arrived now at um, where the astounding voice of Jesus that we spoke of uh, at the baptism is going to be heard and recognized. Um, uh, here they were astounded at his teachings uh, and the authority that he had was an authority that they had not seen uh, uh, from their religious leaders, uh, from their lawgivers. Um, and that authority here is evident in the response of um, an evil spirit, an unclean spirit responding by coming out uh, at his command. This is um, this is something we don't see now, do we? Um, and I'm not sure if, if we want to see it, but I wonder if there aren't ways for us to talk about the transforming presence of God in a way that allows folks to realize that God is still active on this level. Um, not necessarily in creating a new exorcism um, film, but to really be able to bear witness to um, the intrusion of God, uh, which we've mentioned earlier um, uh, over the last couple of weeks, where the intrusion of God really does change reality and that that becomes good news. Um, I think that um, we need testimony to that again. Uh, and so we have to find and point out those ways so that these stories do not just become, um, oh, we're going to pass through it and read it, but they actually become a testimony to what God is doing. Yeah, it's um, the, the commentary talks a bit about this idea of exploring where the, where the demonic lays hold of a divine promise. Mm-hmm. And that had me thinking for a while about about what that looks like. Um, one of the things I think happens in this scene is there's a it's a boundary dispute where the the demonic spirit here says, "What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth?" And it's a it's an odd idiom in Greek. There, you could translate it literally, "What's yours and what's mine?" You know, it's just kind of like you've got your place, you've got your stuff, your authority. This is our place. It's, it's a turf battle of sorts, and we compartmentalize our lives in a lot of ways as well, right? What's the stuff that really belongs to God? What's the stuff that, yeah, I'll take care of? What's the stuff that's I'm kind of indifferent about? And and maybe that's one of these kind of demonic um, negotiations that goes on in our head, that God's only powerful enough to do these things or God's only to be turned to in these issues and maybe what's going on here is Jesus saying, no, I'm going to claim everything uh, and everybody. And that's that's why the coming of the Spirit had to be as dramatic and powerful and loud as we talked about, what is it now, three weeks ago? Because it's a, it's a bit of a bare-knuckled brawl, I think, in Mark's gospel. It's So yeah, I don't know if that's answering your question or not, Joy, or getting to it, but it's, it's maybe where I would start my own reflections if I were preaching this Sunday. The word authority, of course, can also be translated power. And I think it's worth reflecting on that the first demonstration, again, you know, in the season of Epiphany, but the first demonstration of Jesus, of this authority or this power is an exorcism, is, is as you said, uh, Matt, this I'm going to take everything, uh, and I'm going to go anywhere and everywhere. I'm going to I'm going to go into 
the most unexpected places, even the most dangerous places with the spirit with which I am possessed and my power is going to be manifest in this way. And we've talked about this before that whatever Jesus first act is in the gospels is indicative of his, of that gospels Christological portrait. And so the fact that Jesus very first, uh, very first act is not, is not a healing and not a, you know, water into wine or a sermon, but it's an exorcism. And, and the way in which that, the way in which Jesus power drives out those those possessive spirits and i wonder if there's something homiletical there that that how do we how do we imagine what jesus power looks like and and what it's capable of doing um and even though we're not you know we're not necessarily walking around and finding exorcisms all right and and not necessarily in need of another movie, although there was one last fall, wasn't there? There was like exorcism. Yeah, there was something. I don't know. That, the Exorcist, something, something. Anyway, that movie, that first movie, freaky. Yes. Anyway, it does make me think about and question whether I am full of the spirit or not. Mm. If I'm, or what is it? What are those? What are those realities um, that possess me that I need that I need to pray for Jesus power and authority to cast out? And uh, that's kind of where I was on this passage this year. As both of you have alluded to this crossing of boundaries um, uh, that has our preconception, uh, particularly when we, we look at this text and we sort of say, oh, it's an exorcism. Those don't happen anymore. And then uh, as uh, David gives us an opportunity through 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 the commentary to pay attention to, it's like, but what are those demonic forces now? What do they look like? What 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 is the evil uh, that in, intrudes un, unto the, the uh, what, that becomes a boundary against God's placement? Um and and so your question, Caroline, you know, wh- where do I need to let God in again? Um, I I um, I may have mentioned this before, but it continues to be a a, a powerful moment. It uh, captured the internet, but I I learned about it by reading um, um, "Love Your Enemies" by Arthur C. Brooks, um, where he talks about Hawk Newsom who was uh, the uh, head of the uh, Black Lives Matter in New York City. And um, they had gone to a, a Trump rally, um, I think in, I can't remember where, uh, but it was uh, in maybe September 2016, maybe. And um, they gave uh, Newsom, the, the, the Trump uh, supporters gave Newsom two minutes of, uh, of airtime on their platform. And Newsom basically found a way to reach them in those two minutes where he, he said, in short, he said, if we're going to change things, we're going to have to do it together. And the commentaries that happened after that were these people who um, had no favor at all for Black lives um, began to see, having listened to him, that maybe they had more in common than they had a uh, difference. And to th- and the fact that Newsom was able to accept that meant that there were people in the Black Lives Movement back in New York City who disowned him, who said he had taken the wrong course. But it also meant that there were some Trump supporters who suddenly began to care about Black lives. And um, that's the kind of transforming work that I think we need to attend to. That um, sometimes when we are doing that work, where bring where where we bring together opposing views, who can recognize, to use last week's words, a compassionate God uh, that that calls all of us. Um, we're going to lose some friends that we had. Uh, whether that is we're going to lose some friends uh, in our Trump supporting party, or we're going to lose some friends in our Black Lives supporting uh, party. But what we're going to find is 
a people who are able to say that God's compassion can transform lives and disrupt evil. And for me, that's what the world needs to see more of from the people of God. Those comments make me think about Mark 5, which obviously shouldn't add that many verses um, <laughs> this week. Uh, but there you've got the Gerasim demoniac, right, who's delivered from just horrific oppression. But he's also had to be um, isolated, mistreated by his own people for the sake of their own safety. And so that's that's a story about deliverance. There's no question the demonic there has to be driven out, right? That's there's no negotiating with the with the demons, so to speak. But then afterwards, there's the question of what will the townspeople do with him when they see him. I, I don't know how this helps the sermon on, on Mark 1, but just to point out that um, the liberation here, I think, is absolute. But the question then becomes, how is the liberation of all bound up in the liberation of one, right? You know what I mean? That, that nobody's free until everybody's free, um, which is not necessarily... There in Mark 1 explicitly, right? That's kind of a modern uh, slogan, but it one with a lot of truth in it. So to talk about how is this a deliverance, not just for this one man in the synagogue, but how does this also start to reform a community, maybe? I don't know, I'm just kind of riffing off what you're saying, Joy, that we don't... Yeah, because I don't think you're saying there's negotiation with the demonic, but the question then is, what does it mean for, for Jesus to liberate us from... Um, the, all the various ways in which our demons, so to speak, are as communal or societal as they are individual. Is that fair? Am I yeah, reading no. you right? Yeah, absolutely. And that that for me is what's happening in 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 Mark one, uh, because this is this is the story that they will tell that will spread fame of who Jesus is. This is what they're going to say about Jesus. So why would you be surprised in? the fifth chapter that he can do this because that's what you heard about him in the first place. Um, uh, at least according to this one, that that's the astounding authority um, that, that he, that he wields. Um, and uh, it, you know, so if we read that thread all the way through um, what we're going to see, not just in this episode, but in the whole of the gospel is going to take us back to Jonah last week, is you know what kind of God you are serving. You know what this God does. Or do you? Or are you willing, as, as your statement was, Caroline, what, 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 what do I need to allow God to, you know, on, on, on my boundaries that I've created? Um, because that's what we read about last week, uh, if, 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 if you preached on Jonah. And, and so here we are at the beginning of this narrative of a, of a God who, who, who can overpower evil. And the question for us today is, do we believe that evil? And we've seen a lot of evil. We are seeing a lot of evil. Do Caroline, you used this word, I think it was last week, or maybe it was the week before. Do we have this hope? Do we have this hope? Um, and that's the question for us. And, and that's how I read this text. It's a setup for what the entire gospel is going to be pointing us toward. So we... Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Deuteronomy. What do you think? Uh, I know it's an important text in Deuteronomy. <laughs> I don't see how. If we're supposed to relate it to Mark 1, I'm not sure I see it. I I know. I That's exactly what I was about to say, uh, except that... It talks it about to, voice. Yeah, that it connects to, uh, it connects, you know, Jesus as this, uh, to what extent his, you know, ministry is uh, is obviously a prophetic prophetically imbued uh <clears throat> but it the the way in which the prophets you know speak from and for the lord uh and that the voice of the lord is heard through the prophets the voice of god and god's will is heard through the prophets and uh and and then of course particularly with jesus but it 
and with Jesus, and once again with Jesus, I should say. And so maybe, I mean, part of what is important about the exorcism scene is the location, that it's in a synagogue and it's on the Sabbath. And so lest we forget that this is that yes, this is the power or the authority of Jesus, but it really is the uh, also the it's the power and authority of God working through Jesus, and so it it uh, and God's how is it that how is it that what is also revealed or manifested in the exorcism of uh, exorcism scene is you know as the heart of God and and for whom God will have compassion and wants to have compassion as we've talked about. So I think that that, it, it, again, in the synagogue, it's not, you know, outside of, outside of town and it's not any old day. <laughs> it's a, it's a place where, where there is worship of God, praise of God. And it's on a day where God's we're, we're commanded to, to keep and to honor God's name as holy. And so to so to imagine God's will, God's uh, God's compassion, God's desires, God's power being manifested in, you know, the expulsion of evil, uh, is I think is highlighted in these connections. That's a connection I was making. I <laughs> I didn't make such a tight connection. <laughs> um. Uh, I I lingered on verse 20, um, uh, I guess it's 19 and 20, but particularly on 20, any prophet who speaks in the names of other gods or presumes to speak in my name, a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, the prophet will die or uh, to use the words from verse 19, I myself will hold accountable um, to, to those who have not heeded uh, the words uh, I, I think there's a there's a, a sense in which what we have in Deuteronomy and, and that's uh, sometimes uh, missed in places. Um, Deuteronomy is that that second uh, law or the, the second rehearsal of the, the Ten Commandments or an expansive rehearsal of the Ten Commandments. And so here um, you're sort of getting an expansion of not using the Lord's name in vain, not speaking God's word when God hasn't spoken, or not speaking, um, um, or not having an idol or, or someone else's, um, a, a, some other God that you are listening to. Um, and, and the way that I tie that to us is we found a lot of ways to find power. We found a lot of ways to oppress. We found a lot of ways to um, uh, power over others, uh, to allow the systems that are in place to function, uh, so long as my group is the one that is 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 on top. And uh, I think those systems, particularly those systems that are not Christ-like systems, are idolatrous. They are ways in which we act as if that system is speaking God's word when it is actually speaking in, contra in con contrary to God's word. Um, so while it's not a direct tie, um, I think it's a powerful indictment uh, for us to hear um, if, we, if we're going to look at Deuteronomy, um, if, if you're going to preach from Deuteronomy this week. Which might mean you uh, might want to stay away from it. <laughs> I mean, the passage can be a helpful lens, even if you're not preaching on it, but as the as you're looking into Mark 1, if that's where you're going, in that, you know, what makes Moses so great as a prophet is he really likes being with God, <laughs> likes being yeah. up on the mountain, yeah. happy to glimpse God. God seems to really like Moses. Like, I'm going to start a new nation just with you, you know? Um but Moses is so deeply committed to the welfare of the people and will always contend with God for the people. And if that's a helpful lens for viewing Jesus, it's a reminder that this exorcism is not just about, let me show you my power over an unclean spirit, but this anonymous man who never speaks of his own volition. Perhaps it's a reminder that, <laughs> that he has a value that I don't think Mark really lifts up. You know what I mean? He looks kind of like a stage prop to be on a lot of the healing stories are like that, but 
but it's this reminder that maybe part of what prompts Jesus to heal is the suffering of this individual. Beautiful. Psalm 111, praise the Lord. Okay, so you, I, you just have to sing this. I mean, <laughs> come on, you know, praise to the Lord. If you just read it and go praise to the Lord. Uh, and so that's <laughs> not like lame. that. Please don't read it like that. Liturgically lame. So I say you you go to your source and find a hymn that is uh, influenced by based on this verse. One that uh, comes to mind is praise to the Lord, the almighty, the king of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him for he is my light and salvation. So. I don't know what number it is in the ELW, my hymnal, but praise to the Lord, the Almighty, King of creation. That one. Uh, Just sing it for crying out loud. That's my (laughs) homiletical wisdom on Psalm 11. I don't know. Did you sing it before or after the sermon? I think it, what? Uh, I was going to say it depends on where the sermon goes. Yeah. Yeah. But I, it would be a great response to the sermon. Yes, yes. No, it would be. It would actually. And be I'm a glad very you don't know hymn. the number. I'm glad you don't know the number because I don't know the number in the United Methodist hymnal either. But it's there, and so we could sing yeah. it also. Well, I get the LBW and the ELW. I used to know all the numbers, not all the numbers, but a lot of the numbers in the LBW, the Lutheran Book of Worship, and then we got a new one. So then you have to u- learn new numbers. It's very confusing i know none (laughs) i think the all right we've heard is the one i haven't i I haven't gotten familiar with at all matt it's it's great i just don't have i just have many more brain cells to remember numbers like that i've got too many 80s too many 80s pop and new wave songs in my head that you've got using up those precious 80s 80s lyrics that are taking up all those those brain cells are occupied yeah yeah uh, so is right. the now we've got the knowledge that you are reciting here. I don't think it's knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to slide into the text, Caroline. I know. I, I yeah. think the biblical authors would call it folly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm bringing us back to Corinthians here, our third of four readings. We're now in chapter eight of food offered to idols, which is a big deal. Yes, and I I have to admit, it was in this reading that I really did pay attention to this knowledge um, that this was about knowing. Now, concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge and that knowledge puffs us up. I, I don't, I, maybe I just didn't pay attention to this reading before. Um, but um, what does it mean for us to acknowledge one God? What does it mean for us to allow our knowledge to not be the knowledge of the world, to not be the knowledge the folly, as you say, um, uh, 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 Matt, um, but to be our theological claim of what we know about the God made known in Jesus, and that what 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 is being asked here is in in everything that we do, including our eating, that we do that for the sake of the community, um, um, which. You mentioned, Matt, in terms of the healing being uh, for the sake of the community. Um, And here, uh, we talked last week, I think it was, about uh, the body um, and being in uh, the the body um, being um, uh, the the presence of God in our our body. And so what we do with our body. And, And here we are what we eat, the very things that we put into our body as a meal becomes a testimony for the commu- for the sake of the community. Um, I, I heard Richard Hayes tell a, a story about his kids, one who was a, a, a vegan very, very early on, and um, one who uh, was a staunch meat eater. 
and he made a a, a big deal about what Thanksgiving was in their home uh, because he had one 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 child that would eat meat and one child that would not uh, one adult child um, and it it gave me a new read on what does it mean to come together as a community attentive to the dietary needs of others and what that means in terms of commitments that they have made and how that affirms our commitment to forming community. And when I read it that way, wow, this knowledge that I have, what's encouraging for others, what's building up for the community, what strengthens the body, and and by that body, I mean the community. Uh, It's a different way for me to read this text. And to recognize all those intersections around food and meat and wealth and social status and religious affiliations that uh, that the commentary brings out as well. Yes. This is this is a like all matters that divide and unite communities. It's a complicated thing. And so, yeah, what looks what might look to us like kind of a silly, petty, ancient thing, all of a sudden is pretty easy to to transport into our world. I, you know, the line that's just, that's stunning, I think, is when you sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. That um, we talk often about how we have the capacity to meet Christ in the stranger and the whole Matthew 25, sheep and the goats to serve Christ and the stranger. We also have the capacity to sin against Christ by sinning against others. That's the, that's the, that's the flip side of the coin, I guess. It is. Yeah, and it, it's it's calling us into like one of the defining characteristics of the community of of Christ is this is this deep knowledge of the other, of, you know, to possess the to possess the knowledge of Christ is to uh, is to create a community where uh, where all are tended and uh, there are and all matter and all are seen and all are known. And so there's this sense here of, yeah, which you think is a petty thing, right? And it, but it really wasn't, I mean, it really was a real thing. Like, what do we do? But just how can, like you said, Matt, how can we translate that? What are those things that we lift up as, uh, as more important or more of an issue than what really is going on right next to us, right in the community, and and that 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 turn toward the knowledge of the other, uh, and how this affects the other is what Paul is calling us to remember. The challenge of not being just a great pastor, but being a great parent, the familiarity and intimacy of the dinner table. <laughs>